again. Mumsy looking again. Good evening, and welcome to CPT, television's newest experiment in the newest color, black. This week, we're going to have Brother George Kirby, Brother Earl Grant, and we're going to examine the voting patterns of the brother in next Tuesday's election. Sandy, what's on the grapevine? What famous conductor is specially composed an African mass and will conduct it locally this Sunday? Abe, what's in the news tonight? Local black brother calls for back pay for slave ancestors. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. What you saw just there was a video clip from this show when it debuted in 1968 as Colored People's Time, or CPT for short, with host Tony Brown. Detroit Public Television launched this program to build more community involvement and provide a voice for African Americans in the city. Today, we are kicking off our 50th anniversary with this special on-the-road edition of American Black Journal. We're coming to you from the De William V. Banks Broadcast Museum and Media Center near downtown Detroit. This is the building that formerly housed WGPR-TV 62, the nation's first black-owned and operated television station. It's an appropriate setting to take a closer look at minorities in the media as part of our One Detroit commitment to examine important community topics. I'd like to welcome our audience members and invite viewers at home to comment on Facebook and on Twitter. In 1968, the Kerner Commission released its report on the causes of the civil disorders in Detroit and other cities. The group recommended the hiring and training of more black journalists to give African Americans a voice in mass media. The commission also advocated for more coverage of the black community and of racial issues. So where do we stand 50 years later? Here's a One Detroit report. After the uprising in Detroit, the Kerner Commission issued a report stating, the journalistic profession has been shockingly backward in seeking out, hiring, training, and promoting Negroes. The news was a white man's game. The commission found African Americans held just 5% of the editorial positions in news, mostly with black-owned organizations. In Detroit, the free press had two black reporters. The Detroit News had just one. There weren't many African Americans in media at all. I remember Martha Jean the Queen, who was on the radio. Remember, I, that was basically where most of the African Americans were, were on the radio. They were not on television. Livonia so Perryman would appear on DPTV's Detroit Black Journal and Detroit Black News in the 1970s, part of the first wave of African Americans to come on board after the Kerner Report. I, I didn't have a journalism background. I came out of uh, education, and I did tell them, I said, if you train me, I will be one of the best. Twenty years later, a panel of reporters joined Detroit Black Journal host Ed Gordon talking about the state of journalism in Detroit. What about the thought of not uh, giving coverage, the same amount of coverage to blacks as opposed to whites? You, you, you truly believe that that goes on in this city, is that right? I think the record substantiates that. There, there isn't the slightest doubt about that. But I, again, the point is not coverage, but what kind of coverage? Okay. And the rule, right, unfortunately, that is the negative about blacks is going to be prominently used. And displayed. The positive is frequently ignored. And I have a At that time, a National Association of Black Journalists survey found that in the Detroit area, 12.6% doing news were African American, although they made up 22% of the population. I know I'm speculating if Leap ahead two more decades and more strides have been made, but recently, some see efforts sliding back a bit. I'm afraid that it has fallen behind. There was a period in my career when a premium had been placed on getting color into a newsroom and getting diversity into a newsroom. Uh, there was a time when affirmative action was not a bad word. Even though there are more, say, African Americans present on TV, you know, on all the stations, and, and that's good, their influence in the decision-making capacity and being able to determine what stories are covered with the right angle. Uh, I dare say that probably has waned. A recent survey by the American Society of News Editors found African-American news decision makers made up 28 percent at the Free Press and 11 percent at the Detroit News, while our informal survey found about a quarter to a third of news decision makers are African-American at channels 2, 4, and 7, with just a few in upper management. History professor and Detroiter Keith Dye wants to know, with parts of Detroit on the upswing, who's covering the rest? So I can understand the enthusiasm about downtown Detroit and Midtown. I'm all for that. But if you're not in a position of power 
to command the attention that you need, then you will not get the coverage. And so what is the influence on those, of those blacks who are in the media to be able to say, hey, this should be covered? Joining me now are Vicki Thomas, who is NABGA Region 2 Director and City Beat Reporter at WWJ CBS Radio here in Detroit. Also with us is Luther Keith. He's the Executive Director of Arise Detroit, a former Detroit News Editor and Founding Director of the Journalism Institute for Minorities at Wayne State University, and Sheila Cockrell, who is president of Crossroads Consulting and Communications Group and a former Detroit City Council member, also runs an organization called Citizen Detroit. Thanks for being here, all of you. So let's start with the big question here. 50 years later, where are we? Where are we in terms of minority presence in media? But also, as we saw in the clip, where are we in terms of minority decision making? And I think that uh, is a really different question from that first one. Vicky. And that's the important question yeah. to ask. And unfortunately, um, dismal uh, numbers in terms of upper management. These are the folks uh, who make the decisions on how communities of color are covered and not enough minorities are at the table. Uh, NABJ uh, does a diversity census. The last one was done in 2012 by our uh, former president, Bob Butler, and uh, he found that there were like 12, it was 12% of uh, management in, up in newsrooms, and at that time, the population of minorities was about 30 Five percent. So you can see the disparity there. Yeah. So we have a long way to go, definitely. Yeah. Um, Luther, uh, you were an editor at the Detroit News. One of the people I sort of claim as a role model for, for my career. Blame that on You're me. You're a little older than I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but uh, but, but yeah. things were different when you were coming oh, up yeah. than they were when I was coming up, yeah. but we still are kind of in the same yeah. place. I think, I think uh, somebody who started my journalism career back in the 70s when, if you saw the movie The Post, we actually worked on typewriters yeah. when I started. So, <laughs> But uh, I look at it like this. We aren't where we were. We aren't where we should be. Uh, we lost momentum, uh, as we heard Cliff Russell say in that clip. Uh, in the 90s, there's a point in time when affirmative action was a good thing. Uh, I would go to the uh, AAS conventions or NABJ national conventions, and there was this great buzz of mm -hmm. uh, excitement about diversity. Uh, then we hit some economic hard times, and people start peeling uh, staffs back, and uh, black folks got hit hard, and minorities got hit hard. And I think, quite frankly, that uh, we've lost it as a, as a priority with other things that have come along. But I, did, I think this is a good time to refocus. I mean, a lot of, of black folks and other minority folks are doing great journalism today. We have editors. I mean, when I started at the Detroit News, there were zero black editors. I, mean, I was the first one and actually didn't want to be an editor, but I figured <laughs> if I didn't take the job, nobody else would. <laughs> so I, was, I don't want to be an editor. But, so I think it's important that we have to understand that the media in all of its form is the most powerful force on the planet. Mm -hmm. The most powerful, it elects presidents. It takes down governments. And so, as I often say, the people who control that have tremendous power. They affect how we think about other people, how other people think about us, and how we think about ourselves. Yeah. And it's only fair and proper, as I've said many times, if we're going to have an American society that reflects all these great values, we must have a diverse uh, media with black folks and people of color in positions of power. Yeah. But no one likes to give up power. And so that's yeah. something we really have to continue to work at. Yeah. Uh, Sheila, I want to go back to 1968 with you because you were here in the city, you were here for 67. Yep. Uh, and, and I want to talk about message and messaging, uh, both uh, in terms of the role they played during the rebellion in 67 and then uh, the role they started to play as we tried to rebuild the city, right? You know, uh, reshape the city to be a more inclusive place. Uh, talk about the themes that people were thinking about then and, and sort of how they echo now. Well, one of the things looking at the, you know, so the, the survey that you showed of the, of the era was thinking about the number of sources where black voices and black power, if you were, were being uh, manifest to people in the city. There was Scope Magazine with Jim Ingram and Ken Hamlin. There was the uh, League of Re Revolutionary Black Workers who took over the South End. Mm -hmm. There was the Inner City Voice. I mean, there, w there was the Chronicle. There, there were these, uh, and there was uh, certainly Martha Jean the Queen. Um, mm -hmm. There were these entities that really helped shape the narrative and explain for the black community sort of what the powers that be downtown were doing. In the, my dealing around issues of police brutality with um, 
particularly the free press. The news you didn't even bother with. I mean, they were like just the side of the Klan in that era. Um, the free press, you had to deal with sort of proving the case that there was police brutality and it took time and time again to go back to the editor mm -hmm. and the writers to get people to like believe the data that we had gotten out of the police department. So there was a, an expectation um, that things that impacted the African-American community or black community in that era had to be proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. But I'll never forget looking at seeing Bob Bennett and Bill Black and people like that in these venues where there was nobody else of color. And remember, particularly when my, my late husband called a judge a honky dog fool for, in 1968, uh, because of a case where a judge set a confiscatory bond. And I will never forget the look of sheer shock on the face of all these white reporters. And Bill Black and Bob Bennett were like right there, and they were covering <laughs> right. they it. They saw it a little yep. differently, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I wonder what the role of, uh, of the media industry and its decline plays in, uh, in, in minority vo voices. I mean, I, I, I assume there are fewer people, fewer minority uh, young people deciding to, to pursue careers in media because there are fewer jobs, uh, fewer opportunities, and so that maybe makes it a little worse. What do you guys see at NABJ? We see that a lot of folks are going for it. Um, we have the largest con con um, convention for journalists of color in the country. Yeah. And the young people that come to our conventions for the career fair, uh, they are seasoned, they are ready, they, um, they are getting jobs. And mm -hmm. in some cases, they are hired on the spot. But um, I think, too, social media has played a role in it. Consolidation has certainly hurt uh, in terms of the positions that are available because typically when you're the first one in the, the last one in the door, you're the you're first, first one out, out the door right. when they start cutting positions. So we're very proactive, uh, even uh, as the regional director and former Detroit chapter president. Um, I've taken uh, the initiative to write letters when the free press and the news were cutting back on staff to let them know that we're watching and we want you to take into co consideration uh, a diverse workforce. So. Um, you know, it, it's, it's still very tough. We have yeah. a long way to go, and um, uh, I think we'll do better, mm -hmm. but it takes organizations <laughs> like NABJ. Uh, we train our student journalists. We train stu uh, high school students. We cha train college students. So we're doing our part, and we challenge those decision makers at the more. network level, um, you know, local journalists. We're advocate advocates for our membership, um, but we, we have a tough job to do. But, yeah. you know, I'm up to the task because I appreciate people like Bill Black. I actually <laughs> right. started a scholarship <laughs> fund uh, for the local chapter in Bill Black's yeah, name. We have a great local chapter. I want to applaud the Vicky for and Vince McCraw and all those folks. Uh, but I think it's important that this is a time to remember that if you want to, the media has such an important role in this society, mm -hmm. and I don't have to tell you what's going on nationally. That, that verifies that. And there's a reason we, there's a First Amendment is the a First Amendment. There's a reason that, that the first thing dictators do when they take over a country and they kill everybody <laughs> is they control the press mm -hmm. um, because it's so powerful. And we've seen examples of the media playing a, a positive role in changing society. Now, I don't have to talk about the civil rights movement and what right. went there, but we've got the instance in Flint. We've got, of course, the situation with Michigan State. Uh, and if you get a chance, this is not an endorsement, but if you look at the movie The Post, which is out here, I think that's going to do something that yeah. is for what it means to our society. I mean, this is a really important stuff. This is not a job. It's right. a career. It's, it's something that you can be passionate that about. That movie makes right. journalists look like right. heroes. And we hear right. about the young millennials, and, and, what, and they just want to make some money and, and be, uh, uh, do software. But I think that still inside the, uh, these young people, there beats a heart of people who want to make change, who want, want to make, make a, a difference. difference. Yeah. And there are not many places where you can do that as you can when you are a journalist. Yeah. Uh, Sheila, your work with Citizen Detroit is about trying to make sure Detroiters are informed sure. uh, about decisions that they make, uh, the votes that they cast. Uh, that's kind of a media role. Uh, and, and I'm curious about how you see the media informing the people that you're dealing with uh, at, Cita at Citizen Detroit, uh, is it from a sort of diverse perspective now, more diverse than what you, what you saw 50 years ago? Oh, absolutely yeah. more diverse. Yes, I mean, I, I, in, in f the media is the key institution to, to, 
to educate people um, in, in ways and methods that people understand most quickly. So working with the Michigan Chronicle, which I started doing in 1968 around police brutality, uh, work when Longworth Quinn Jr. was the, uh, the editor up through today, worked most recently with Keith Owens with, with Citizen Detroit, uh, the Free Press, WDET, WDIV, to me, this is not to leave out anybody else, mm -hmm. but those are the people that Citizen Detroit has worked the most closely with and look forward to expanding initiatives, because where are people getting their news? They're getting it on social media, yep. which half the time I can't figure out how to make it work. <laughs> um, but it's really critical, whether it's Facebook or Twitter um, or Instagram. Yeah. We just at our Citizen Assembly on Saturday, we did Instagram for the first time. I did not do Instagram. <laughs> people who know what they Failed were doing did it. it. Right. But we've gotten a lot of feedback from it. This is where people are getting their information and their yeah. news. Okay. I think it's important right. to remember very quickly, yeah. as I have taught journalism, social media is not journalism. Being a blog is not right. being a journalist. That's I think true. it's important to understand big it. Big difference, right? Right. It's big yeah. difference. Professional, professional matter. Right. right. But if you look on, on, on uh, particularly on Twitter, where, where you read Charles Blow yeah. and other people, you're Most getting... Most are there. Yeah. Yes, and yeah. you're getting strong voices there. Okay, and I kept this panel in, in time, right? <laughs> <laughs> that was the challenge. And I, right? I would be remiss if I did not <laughs> tell everybody that the NABJ convention will be right here, here in, in Detroit. Detroit. That's in, right, in, uh, in August, right? August, 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 August yeah. 1st through the That's 5th. Right. Very big deal. I worked yeah. hard to get it here, and so uh, we want your support. We want the community to be engaged. Uh, those students will be here getting trained by professional journalists, and um, I'm just extremely excited. Yeah. Uh, we'll have newsmakers in town. It's going to be a real high right. point. And, this, and we, one of the things that NAB <laughs> also does is we honor our own, and uh, Stephen was our journalist of the year. Oh. A million years ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks to all three of you for being here. Thank you, Thank Steve. You.